Good evening, everyone. Good to see you back this evening. Uh, we are nearing the end, unfortunately, kind of. We, uh, we have Sheree until Thursday evening, and so um, what are we on now? Tuesday evening. So after tonight, uh, two more, and then she heads down to Auckland uh, to be picked up to, take, to be taken to Hamilton. She'll do a similar program in Hamilton. So uh, if you happen to know anyone who you know would be blessed by this and they live in the Hamilton area, uh, we can certainly give you the information for that, but uh, they, they, she will be presenting down there for a week's worth of time. So if anybody's coming to mind right now and you can direct them and give them personal encouragement, we'd really appreciate that. And then the week after that, she will be at the pa Papatoe Seventh-day Adventist Church in Auckland. So if you know someone in Auckland that uh, would really be blessed by this, please encourage them to attend uh, that program as well. So Hamilton next and then Auckland uh, after that. So tonight we're talking about uh, meeting the God who delights in our recovery. And uh, obviously Cherie will, uh, will lead out with that. Um, and then tomorrow night we're looking at the stages of recovery. So tomorrow night's going to be a pretty big one as we talk about what the journey really practically looks like as we grow in our recovery experience. So we, we uh, obviously encourage you to uh, be here for tomorrow and tomorrow evening as well. Um, just a reminder again, uh, if you want to join our uh, recovery group uh, starting on w next Wednesday, the 22nd, 7 o'clock, it'll be right here in this venue in the conference room down the hallway there, the other warm room where the food is, and uh, we, we will start that at 7 o'clock uh, Wednesday next week. So Wendy, who I pointed out to you last uh, yesterday evening, I don't know if she's here right now. No? All right. Wendy's down there, all right? So uh, do, do try and connect with her uh, at the end of this evening if you've been thinking about it and you want to put your name down for that group as well. Right, so I think that's about it for this evening. We're just waiting for Cherie to come up. Waiting for me? Yes. <laughs> all right. Do you have a question for me again? Do I have a question for you? Hmm. Because he always starts with questions. And sometimes even how you say these questions cracks me up. <laughs> because I always take it in a kind of a little bit slanted way. Right. Yeah. And so um, I would say, um, go ahead. I'm ready for you this time. All right. What could I ask you uh, this evening? Hmm. Um, I don't know. I don't have a So last this night, evening. what's really fun about last night, because I, I never take notes, I never know what I'm going to talk about. So before I leave last night, I say, what's tomorrow's presentation going to be? <laughs> and he says, like, aren't you the speaker? And so <laughs> it was a very funny, the reaction from you was very funny. And um, so um, my prayer is tonight that we are really looking at um, God in recovery. And so my favorite part of any kind of recovery presentation is to look at how God actually does that. But before we start, it is the pastor's birthday. <laughs> Woo! -hoo! Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Woohoo! Hey, awesome. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Appreciate that. Thank you for the best wishes. Thank you for embarrassing me, Leo. <laughs> All right. So, least, what was fun is yesterday, um, um, Danny came up and said, it's my dad's birthday tomorrow. So we went looking for a, a cupcake of some kind or a cake of some kind, and um, it was delightful to, to hang out with her and, and uh, say happy birthday. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I did think of a question. All right. I was just telling them that you're headed to Hamilton next and, and Papatoe after that. Yeah. Uh, I was saying to them that they should, uh, if they know anybody in Hamilton or Auckland that, need, that they think would be blessed by the program, they should encourage them in person. Okay. Are you doing exactly the same thing as you're doing here? Will there be any differences? Um, any ideas? <laughs> Did you not hear me a few Aren't minutes you the ago? Speaker? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. You know what? Um, I, is it the same um, flyer? No. Okay, so I would say no. Um, <laughs> 
But you know what? I, I think it's really interesting because there are times that, that once we hang out together even, I get to know you more, and I know that rather than this thing, I would like to cover this thing. So I really feel like uh, sometimes um, I really like the flexibility of, of getting to know whoever's there and then going with that. So it's going to be kind of the basic thing. We're going to do addiction, addictive personality, and that kind of stuff. Um, but, um, you, know, I, you know, I think that when I get there, I'll know how we're going to do it. Make it up as we go. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Do what? I know, see, amen. See, I, I'm a sanguine and I have two brain cells. You put that together and you never know what's going to happen. And you are the same, I heard. Uh, yeah, maybe not quite. <laughs> a, little more, a little more melancholy. You do take notes of that some point when you speak? Notes, no. Yeah, I, yeah. So no. We're notes are an encumbrance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but we're going to start? Should I just start? Not yet. We're going to pray. All right. Oh. Can't, can't start without praying, right? Yeah. All right. Heavenly Father, thank you for blessing us. We're here again in this place to hear your word, uh, to uh, connect your word with our lives, to experience something new, something different. And we pray that this evening you will bless us in this regard. So um, pour out your spirit, um, give to us a measure of healing like we've never known before. And of course, we ask that you'll bless Cherie as she speaks to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, it's really interesting when we talk about this part of um, recovery is that, you know, we know, we talked about where I've come from. I'm a heroin addict in recovery. I've been in recovery. I thought I would get a week, a month, a year. I've been in recovery probably for 35 years. Um, all right, thank you, amen. Because you know what? For a lot of us, we don't get that kind of time, and we don't get that kind of clean time. So I am really grateful, you know, um, for the amount of time that I've gotten um, on this side of all that craziness. And so, you know, been in recovery for a long time, and um, talking about, like, what is addiction? What is, um, um, you know, what is the personality from an addict? What draws us into addiction? And all of that kind of stuff is fun. But this this is my favorite presentation because we get to talk about what about spirituality and recovery. And I want to just say when, you know, you know, I met God and I, I, I literally had a gun to my face and somebody that's going to blow my head off in a drug house strung out on heroin. And the only thing I got was a sense of God himself saying, I am crazy about you. And if you trust me, I will change your life right? And I just wept like a baby. Like, you know, I don't know what trust means. I don't know what love means. I have 42 warrants for my arrest. I've been strung out for the last 10 years. I don't even know, like, how do you stand up through that kind of stuff? You know, I even remember when I decided that, you know, what if, what if there is a God? And what if he can help us? And what if he sees us? What if he hears us? And I'm brave enough to stand up. Even on that particular day, the only reason I kind of stood up really is there was a naked guy in the living room playing air guitar high on some kind of hallucinogenic. And I remember thinking that God shouldn't be here, you know? <laughs> and I wanted to sneak God out the window, like as if, you know, like, God, you don't look in the living room because, you know, that naked guy is there. So it's like, but, you know, even being able to realize now that God does his best work when we're the most strung out. Um, but I stepped into recovery, trusted him. Um, one of the first things that um, I thought I needed to do was, first of all, I went through the whole withdrawal process, which was um, crazy for some of us. Um, the withdrawal and um, getting away from our addictions, um, getting physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally um, through that kind of time time where you feel like you're not going to make it. I remember even going to a psychiatrist once during that process, and I said to him, like, I, I am not going to make it. This is crazy. Maybe I'm just schizophrenic. Maybe I'm bipolar. Maybe, and I just went on and on, and I'm not going to get through today, and this, I, I, I just can't do it. And, and I went just probably 25 minutes just ranting. And I finally just was exhausted, so I sat down. And this guy looked at me and said, it looks like you're really having a hard day. <laughs> I wanted to grab him by the throat. This is my life. What do you mean a hard day? And he said something that was so absolutely incredible to me. He said, you are changing every single thing. If you don't expect days like this, you're going to set yourself up. And I couldn't believe what a gift that was. 
There are going to be hard days. There are going to be hard weeks and months, maybe even years, but you're going to make it. And I just walked out thinking, who is that guy? <laughs> I want to I say thank you so much because I didn't think I was going to make it. But you know what he did is say, you will make it. So I walk out, and then I decide I'm going to call an attorney because I have all those warrants for my arrest. And I say something like, you know, I have a few warrants for my arrest. <laughs> Um, how can I take care of them? And he's like, well, how many exactly? And so I tell him, and you know what he says? They're going to put you in jail. And I'm thinking, okay, thank you. <laughs> you know, but it was, it was that, even looking at that kind of stuff, I had warrants for my arrest, I should go to jail, but most of the warrants I had were when I was 18 and under. And they weren't for huge crimes. Like, I, I never murdered anyone. I mean, I've done some things that I didn't get caught for, but those things were very kind of minor things. And they all kind of get off your record when you turn 18. And I thought, oh, shut up. How fun is that, you know? So I had to cover a couple of things, but then learned to read, went back to school. And, and I, I, I did it, you know, I told you um, years later, I meet my husband. It's like every part of the journey was absolutely amazing, amazing. And, and I'm going to start with, um, um, it's a story with my family. So, so yeah, um, years later, I, I learned to read. I went back to school. I got a nursing degree. I worked inpatient psych. I love crazy people because I am one. Do you know what I mean? I would read chapter one, and I'd think, oh, man, i got to try that. <laughs> and then I would teach it. It was just so much fun. And then somebody, it, I would read about how to do this or how to heal from this, and, and I would say, okay, and then I, I would get to um, teach it, which reinforced it. So I really loved working with addicts. I loved working um, inpatient. Um, I did so well at my job because I loved it. I got awards, Citizen of the Year. <laughs> and I'm like a heroin addict in recovery, and I'm getting Citizen of the Year, and I'm thinking, should I put that on the wall? <laughs> should I do that? I'm like the Grand Marshal in the Fourth of July parade. I'm like waving at everybody. And it was just so fun. And what I think about in recovery, when you take recovery from a, a, a level where you have to go through that craziness, um, but you literally say, what if there is a God that sees me? But if there is a God that actually says, let me walk alongside of you, what if he knows my name, you know? And, and to me, the most incredible thing about recovery in a spiritual sense is to be able to say that I'm not only going to step into what I know um, about coming off of drugs, but I'm going to actually um, turn it over to God. And so any 12-step program, if you look at step one is I am powerless. Step two, there's a God in heaven that can restore, there's a God that can restore me to sanity. Amen. I don't know if anybody wants to say amen to that, but I was crazy as, you know what I mean? I still may be a little crazy, but there's a God that can actually restore that, that can look at that pain and anger and all that kind of stuff and help me with my bitterness. And, you know, so I, I just bought all that stuff. And, and I'm going to take a side note, because today I wake up, I'm just brushing my teeth and flossing. And my filling pops out, right in the front of my face, you know? And I'm thinking, oh, great, you know? And, and I, you know, you watch it go down the drain, so, so it's like, wait, you know? And so, so I'm thinking, I'm in another country, I have a feeling that pops out, I'm going to be speaking for the next three weeks, and I, I, I text my husband, who is such a cheap guy, not cheap in any sense, but he likes saving money. I said, "Han, my feeling popped out, I'm going to have to see a dentist, that's going to cost probably about this much, and, and he's like, I could tell it's probably killing him. Okay, you know, but um, so then I find out that the people I'm staying with, it's amazing to stay at your house, and thank you for that, but she works for a dentist. And I'm like, shut up, how fun is that? So being able to tell, call her, so she calls the dentist, they get me in right away. He's incredible. The guy is incredible, just really a nice guy. Fixes a feeling, and after we're done, I'm ready to pay him, and he says, no charge. And so, and I love that stuff, but I think there is a God in heaven that knows when your feeling pops out. 
Do you know what I mean? It could have popped out anywhere. It pops out when I'm staying with somebody that works with a dentist. So I really believe I'm fanatical in the sense that if you're going to trust your recovery, trust it to the people around you and connect with the people around you. But don't forget, there is a God that knows your name. And literally surrender that. Know that he will restore you to sanity. But every day I have to say, okay, here's all of my craziness. What are we going to do today? So I ended up um, um, in recovery, did the nursing thing. I loved my life. I had such a great time. I was hiding everything. I wasn't sharing um, you know, with the people I worked with that I was a heroin addict or that you know, I worked in clubs most of my life, or I'm a drug dealer, my, my, my sister's a stripper, my other sister makes pee for a living. I mean, I wasn't sharing much, um, but I was just enjoying my recovery, and, and really enjoying my recovery. Um, I decided that I wanted to do stuff like this. I wanted to work for God, right? And I got a call one day. It was the craziest call ever. Somebody said, you know, man, um, I heard your story, and would you come and speak? And I thought, who is this? Well, this is so-and-so from Alaska. And I'm thinking, oh, stop. You know? And I'm thinking, really? And I'm wanting to look around. It's like, is somebody playing a joke on me? Would you speak about your recovery? And they said, how much do you charge? And I thought, oh, stop. You're killing me. So I'm thinking, not only do you want me to speak, but you'll actually pay me to do what I'd love to do. So I didn't know how much to say. So I said 100 bucks. <laughs> and she said, a hundred bucks? Yeah, I think she sent it to me right away. Let's sign something. And so she said, how much do you talk for a hundred bucks? And I thought, I'm ADD. I, I never shut up. So, <laughs> so I did 16 presentations in four days. It was so hard crazy. I, I thought, you know what, I never want to do that again. I'll never say 100 bucks again. But in this presentation, um, I did a women's retreat and a hospital. I, did, I talked to a church and a community event. But on the last leg, and in Alaska, Alaska is just this big place, right? And so when you go from one place to another, they literally fly you to one place. And remember, I'm a drug addict in recovery. You know, I sold drugs and worked in strip clubs almost my life. I mean, it was just, re oh, can I say that? Do you, sorry, I didn't mean that. So anyhow, so, but I have this background that's just crazy, right? So now I'm being flown from place to place to place talking about recovery. And I am beside myself. I want to say, you are so fun. I'd kiss you on the face if you were right here, you know? And, and so I get to this last, this last place before I fly home, and it's a place called Dillingham, Alaska. And this guy picks me up. He was about a 1,000 years old. I mean, he was the oldest guy I've ever seen in my life. But he was the kind of guy that you would expect to see in Alaska, that's been in the wilderness their whole life, that is very strong. The lines on his face were so beautiful that I wanted to get a sketch pad out. I wanted to draw this guy. It was just, he was gorgeous. So he comes up, and he's like going to pick me up. But he's a 1,000 years old. So he goes to get my bag. And I said, no, I'll carry it. And he looks at me like I'm crazy. What do you mean you'll carry it? And he just grabs it, and the guy is so strong, puts it in his truck. He has a truck that is old, old. He, you know, one of the doors are even like half on. I don't even think it fully shuts. And I'm thinking, how funny is it? You know? And I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, this is the funniest thing ever. And he's talking away, and we're driving like two hours. But in the middle of Alaska, I mean, it just is this wilderness. And I'm thinking, I'm like a missionary right now. How cool is that? And I'm feeling like everything I've ever prayed for, and I'm looking around saying, this is amazing. And then he stops in front of this lake. Nothing around us. And I'm thinking, oh, I bet he's senile. I bet he's crazy, you know? And so we stop, and he gets out. And I'm thinking, you're getting out? Where are you going, hon? <laughs> there's nothing. You know, there's nothing. And then I see this little boat with a little engine. And I'm thinking, no, no, no. And he puts my suitcase in there, looks at me like, and I'm like, no way. What are we doing? So I get in this boat, and I'm like, this is the craziest, craziest thing. So we're in the boat. And remember, I'm an addict in recovery. I mean, I, I, in my mind, I'm just telling myself every joke on the planet. I want to bust off. This is the craziest thing. So we go over to this little island. It's called the Lechnigik, Alaska little tiny island. We get off, and it's an Eskimo village. 
the alcoholism is off the chart. I mean, people are, uh, you can tell that people are in pain, strung out, generationally have been um, dealing with stuff, and you could just see it. And most of the people have lost someone in their fishing business due to alcoholism just falling off the boat. You know what I mean? I mean, it was just amazing what happened in this area. But all of a sudden I realized, man, you, we are going to talk about addiction, and this is pretty serious. And so I go to an elementary school. In the elementary school, these little tiny kids, they're just adorable. And you can't really tell your whole story uh, with little tiny kids because, you know, it's just too graphic. Unless those little tiny kids are from broken homes, they've been molested, they've got alcoholism in and out of their family, they've seen domestic violence, all that kind of stuff. And these kids actually knew where I came from. But Alaska has weird, um, a weird thing. And um, I will say, let me um, get somebody to come up. Um, who am I going to pick? I need, will you come up for a minute? Yeah, yeah, come on up. And so they, Alaska, they, they have a, um, a way that they deal with their problems that is very unusual. So when they come up and they want to tell you something, they will come up and they'll say, I just want to share with you about what I've been through in my life. It's been horrible, <laughs> I'm telling you. And even when I was a kid, from the time I was little, <laughs> it was just the most incredible thing. And, and, and sorry, thank you. They will hold you for 40 minutes. I mean, the whole time. And I have space issues. Does anybody have space issues? And I'm thinking like you, like... <laughs> but they hold you the whole time. Well, I got used to that almost right away because everybody did it, you know? And so now I'm at this elementary school. This little girl comes walking down, and I realize that she's going to do that. And she's like nine. She looks, she's tiny. And so I sit down just so that um, we're the same height, you know? And so she starts to hold me, and she says that my life is just like yours. And I thought, no way. You know, you're tiny. You're just this little kid. And she talked about both parents are in rehab, grandparents who she was supposed to stay with. Um, one died of Alzheimer's and the other one is just old. And she goes from place to place and trades off favors in order to stay in school, in order to have food. And she starts telling me the story, but she is tiny. And I want to just hold her. And, I, and, and her name was Laura Fletcher. And I said, um, Laura... I'm going to be here for a little while, and I don't have an assistant. Would you be my assistant? And she said, yes. And she almost cried. And so I got to hang out with her. And the only thing I could promise her is sometimes in our craziest times, in the most painful things in our life, we survive it. And I couldn't tell her that somebody's going to rescue you or your family's going to behave or whatever, but I could tell her that you will survive. You'll survive. And so we just did that for each other. And it was amazing to hang out with her. And that, the day that I'm leaving, I looked at her and, and we prayed. And, and she was actually 12. She malnourished, so she looked tinier. But I said to her, um, man, I hate to leave you here. It's illegal to adopt um, um, or to pull out. She couldn't come home with me or any of that kind of stuff. And, and I said, I hate to leave you here because, man, I... Um, I just love you and thank you. And, and, and she said, you know, the first time I read your book, and I said, what? And I had written Miracle from the Street. There's a, 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 a life story. She said, the first time I read your book, I asked God, someday, can I meet her? And I thought, you mean this whole event was about you? And all of a sudden, I saw God in a whole different way. God moved everyone so that Laura Fletcher could get some kind of assurance. And so to me, when I talk about God, I talk about a God that says, I know who you are. I know where you are. I know what your prayer is. And it could have been anybody. It could have been someone else that she prayed about, but she happened to pray about me. And I think that I could understand her in a lot of ways. I've known Laura since then. She is now a mother, has her own children. Um, she did survive. 
but it was a hard life for her. And so it's like, you know, to me, when I talk about God and I talk about recovery, I, I talk about a God that says, you know what, if you trust me to your recovery, um, even in the worst or darkest times, I actually can light a candle. I, I'll get you through. And so anyhow, so um, um, one thing led to another. I got into ministry. We, um, I remember trying to, at one point, I thought, okay, maybe I'm a, like, I am a missionary, right? And, and maybe I should get a job, like working somewhere where I could actually do this. And so somebody walked by and I said, man, um, will you hire me? And they said, who are you? Well, drug addict in recovery, um, and they're like, well, whatever. <laughs> you know, I called the church. Will you hire me? The church that I called told me that maybe you need to call the conference office. I don't even know what that is, but I called the conference office, and they said, who are you? Well, I'm an addict in recovery, love God. I think he's calling me. Okay. <laughs> you know, maybe you need to call the union. Maybe you need to call the general conference. I called everybody. And everybody looked at me the same way. It's a crazy thing to raise your hand as an addict in recovery and say, you know what, will anyone pay me to do this? Because um, I want to do this the rest of my life. And I couldn't get a yes from anyone. And one time, does anybody know 3ABN? 3ABN said, Would, can we interview you? And I flew out there. They paid for my flight. <laughs> it was so fun. And I, I'm sitting there, and, and we're doing the interview. And it was when they used to have a porch. They ended their program sitting on a porch. And so we're doing the interview, and we're getting ready to end the interview. And they do a break, and then they go out on the porch, and they come back, and they end the interview. And so I looked at this guy, Danny Shelton, and I said, would you hire me? I'm, I, I think I'm called by God, and uh, I can't afford to do this unless somebody hires me. And he said, well, how much do you need? And I told him, and then we went out on the porch, and he had left. I thought he went to the bathroom or something, but he had left, and he comes back, and he hands me a check for exactly what I asked for. And he said, um, good luck. And he has sent me that check every year since that time. Somebody said, does she work for you? He said, no, she works for God. He's never asked me to do anything. He's, I'm, not, I'm not an employee with that. We run our own organization, but somebody gave me enough money um, to stand up with this calling. And the only reason I'm even saying that is somebody needs to hear that. When we step into health, when we step into recovery, when we step into that, um, we have a God that knows your name knows your name. And you've got to know that because everything about you will scream that he doesn't know my name. It's not about me. He doesn't care about me. And that's not true. Every one of us, every one of our families. When I came off the street, I'm 23 years um, old. I'm strung out on heroin. I could barely read. I have warrants for my arrest. And if you would have asked me, what's your giftings? I would have said, I have none. That was a lie. That was a lie, but I didn't know it was a lie. So um, one thing led to another. I do this ministry, and I get a call from my family at one point, and um, I told you how I met my husband, who I love. My husband was a Boy Scout till he was 18 years old. His dad's an ambassador for the United States to Bangladesh. My dad's a drug dealer. <laughs> It's like ridiculous, but we fall in love. We have a child. We're doing ministry. I mean, it's just been an incredible life. I'm doing ministry. My husband was not even a Christian. Um, um, has anybody married somebody that spiritually could care less? It's a hard thing, right? So he, was, he, was, he loves me, but he really could care less about this God thing. And I prayed. How long do you think I prayed for him? Fifteen years. Not a couple weeks, 15 years. And you know what God told me the whole time? Love him and don't jump on him. Don't, don't shame him. Just you are his wife, you know, and so 15 years. But, you know, I didn't do it really well all the time. There was one point he came home late from work, and I was so tired of just praying and not having someone to pray with or walk with or do ministry with. He came home late, and I thought, man, I'm worried about him. And all of a sudden, I thought, well, maybe he got in a car accident or something. Yeah, if, what if he dies? And then I could just marry a Christian. <laughs> and I had to repent. <laughs> So I'm not even saying I did this well the whole time. I had to say, you know, all right, I'm sorry. I probably shouldn't think like that. 
But anyhow, so, um, so all that time goes by, and at, at one point, um, somebody said in earshot of Brad that I don't think Cherie should actually be working for God. And, and, and he's like, are you kidding me? She's like a freak about God, you know? And so he just listened, and the person said, if she was called by God, her husband would be standing by her side, and he is not. And my husband was so mad, grabbed the pastor by the throat. It's like, how dare, no, 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 no. And he went on and on, and the pastor simply said, well, what's up? Why aren't you by her side? And so everything changed. Brad starts um, um, turning his own recovery over to God. My husband is not a drug addict, but he is so arrogant. <laughs> his dad was an ambassador to the United States. His mom's a violinist. He was an ego scout. Is a principal trumpet of the Philharmonic and teaches at the university. Do you know what I mean? So if he looks at you, uh, excuse me, are you talking to me? You know, and he doesn't say that out loud, but that's kind of where he was at. And I would get mad at him at times and say, Han, sometimes you talk down to people. And he's like, you know what, it's just because of where you came from. No, 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 it's because you're a jerk. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I want to say that in a really nice way, but he had his own recovery to do. And when he actually started to surrender to God and God started walking him through his own recovery, it was amazing to watch because arrogance and pride and all of that kind of stuff, it's different than drug addiction, but the recovery journey is just as tough. The repentance is just as real. So I watched him do that, and at one point he gets it, and he just started crying. And he literally came up and he just kind of knelt in front of me and he said, I want, as your husband, um, to say I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry um, for the years that I wasn't there for you and all of that kind of stuff. And I, I wanted to say, no, no, get up, it's okay. And I just started crying. I couldn't even say that. I thought, I can't believe that he's just literally saying to me, I promise you that from this point on... Um, I, I'm here. Um, and so he started his own healing. Um, he was so ridiculous. Like, he would walk down the street, and he would just get a sense that you need prayer. Can I pray for you? <laughs> and I mean, he was ridiculous. You want to say, you can't just do that to people. They're going to they're gonna, they're gonna shoot you or something, you know? But he would pray for the banker and the person that does his hair. If I'd go to the bathroom, is you want prayer first? No, just go into the bathroom. You know, I mean, he, he was just, he went from not being there at all to really covering everything. I mean, it was amazing to watch him. Um, went to my daughter and, and worked through some stuff and covered that. At one point, because of my molest issues, um, he started to share the fact um, that he has been um, sexually active since he was little and that he had multiple partners and some of them he didn't even really ask their name. You know, I don't, I'm not going to ask guys to raise your hand, but sometimes that's just the culture, right? And he started to really work through that with God and then he asked me, as my husband, would you forgive me? And I thought, you probably, you don't have to do that. And he said, no, just let me do that. Um, I wish, he said, he looked at me and he said, I wish you were the only woman I had ever known. And I just, as a woman, I just cried. I thought, what? You know, and I'm thinking, who says that to someone? You know, I wish you were the only woman that I'd ever even held hands with. I just want to say I'm sorry because I didn't get it. I didn't know. And, and so we, we just held each other and kind of processed through that. But it was amazing to watch him in his journey. And it was amazing to watch him in his, his spiritual surrendering to God, all the kind of garbage as far as, you know, what he thought and the kind of things that he watched. And, and, you know, even, you know, he'd jump on, and I didn't know this, but he'd jump on porn sites once in a while. He never shared that with me. Like, kind I was on porn today. I just want to share that. You know, I mean, he never did that kind of stuff. But in his healing, he just said, I just want you to know that um, all the stuff that I felt was natural or normal, I just want to say I'm sorry. And it was really cool to walk through that. And then I get a call from my family, and my sister's in the hospital, and she's on life support. I love my sister. You know the one that got her boobs done? 
wanted to show everybody. She's, a, she's another stripper, and she's just, um, just kind of crazy and all that stuff. But she's in her 50s, and she's still trying to do work in an industry that um, they, uh, you know, hires 16-year-olds 16 16 year or even younger, you know? And she just can't do what she has always done. And um, so um, she's on life support. Um, I fly out because I love her, but man, she is a she's a mess. And if she heard me say that, she would just get up and scream. She'd be angry at me because she thinks that she is not a mess. Um, but I flew out there, and, and she's hooked up to everything. I mean, she's got she's got machines breathing for her. She's got IVs everywhere. Um, uh, they are keeping her alive. She's in a, in induced coma, all that kind of stuff. My dad, my stepdad, is in the ICU waiting room. And he's just smoked some weed, so he's very relaxed. You know, my dad smokes weed all the time. So even in the ICU room, if he gets nervous, he just goes out, smokes a little pot, comes back in, and he's just all good. You know, my mom's ha handing out Valium. Um, everybody's um, okay with that. My sister, the pee addict, is just like, you know, man, I'm glad you're here. And, and I, I don't think it's actually a big deal. I think she's going to be okay, you know. And so she is just like, uh, and I walk in, and I'm thinking, wait. This is a big deal. I love her. And uh, man, I did nursing for years. And I looked at some of her x-rays and I'm thinking, I don't think she's going to survive. And then I go in and I'm, I'm sitting next to her and I remember saying to her, man, when is the last time that I said I love you? You know, I'm so protecting my own recovery that I don't even kind of hang out much. Uh, my daughter, you know, like I have this daughter that's beautiful. Um, she's never done a drug. She's been born and raised in a, in a, in a Christian home. Um, I don't take her home to my folks anymore or very much her growing up because my younger sister is making pee in the garage. If the police bossed us, they can take my child away. And so I really have been careful with all that. But now my sister's dying and I can't remember the last time I hung out with her or the last time I said I love you or the last time I just thought, you know what, um, man, you are absolutely... Um, I, I, I love you. You're my sister. And, and so I'm sitting there. One time I did take her to my sister's house. And um, my sister has a home on the beach that some guy bought her. It's beautiful. And, and, um, and um, I forgot my daughter's bathing suit. And so my sister says, that's okay. And she goes in and gets this little thong with a couple tassels. <laughs> And so she could just wear this. And my daughter starts laughing. She's like 10. She's laughing. And I said, you will never wear that. You know, so I do take her over, but, you know, my family's kind of crazy. I took my daughter over when she was a couple years old to my, um, my sister's house that's a pee addict or to my mom's house. And my sister came running in. She's high as can be. She's, she's skin and bones. All her teeth are rotted out. She's got crank sores all over. Her hair's falling out in patches. She's got aplastic anemia. Her bone marrow doesn't even produce iron anymore. And she looks that sick, right? And my daughter comes running in as her two or three-year-old. And my sister runs up and like, ah, how are you? And she has her in the air and she's screaming and my daughter starts crying and screaming and she slams my daughter down and she says, I should have known that you were going to have a little brat and walks away. And so with my daughter going up to my daughter and saying, you know what? And how do you explain that Aunt Joni is just an addict and she didn't mean that? right? But it's, I've been really protective. But the day I'm coming in and watching my sister on life support, I, my heart broke. And um, I, I stayed at her house during that time. And I go um, to her house. And my sister was facing her third uh, DUI. So drunk driving, I don't know what you call it in New Zealand. But um, in California, if you get three major hits like that, you could actually face prison for life. It's called Three Strikes, You're Out. Um, and she's got her third DUI. Uh, she's an alcoholic. Um, um, one time she said to me when she had her, like, her second DUI, she said, you know why I got it? And I thought, is this a trick question? 
you were driving drunk? <laughs> and she said, no, my girlfriend. And, and I, you know, because when we're high, it's never our fault, and it's never about that. But anyhow, so um, the third DUI, she's turning 50. She cannot do what she does um, anymore. And um, she had a number of other things happening all at once. The IRS was asking her, how can you have this house? How can you make this kind of money? We haven't had any records of you paying taxes. So she's facing that. And so she tried to kill herself took an overdose. And when she took the overdose, she took enough pills that it blew a hole in her stomach, right? Which let a leak of acids into her abdominal cavity, which burned both of her lungs and filled her lungs up. And so the reason that she can't breathe on her own is her lungs actually are burnt. If you looked at the x-ray, it was the worst set of lungs I think I've ever seen. Not because of the smoking and the drugs, but because of the acids. And they weren't sure she was going to survive. And, and I went in there, and I remember saying to her, is, um, man, I love you. And when I said I love you, all of the alarms on all of the machines started going off. And, and I, I thought, wow, I mean, the, the breathing thing, and the nurses are running in, and all that kind of stuff. And I'm thinking, what just happened? And they said, did you just talk with her? And I'm like, no. Because <laughs> no, I'm very honest in that way. There's like, no, no, no. And she said, we've got her in an induced coma. We do not want her to come out. Do not talk with her. And I thought, so she was trying to come out. And she heard me. And I'm just trying to get my head around that. And the nurse leaves, and I just said to her, I'll try not to talk, but you know that I love you. And all the machines went off again. I'm like, all right, all right, I get it. I'm sorry, you know. And I and I I I, I talk with you know my mom and everybody's in the and you know my family. I love them, but everybody's lost in their own addictions and all that kind of stuff. My older sister is prescription drug addict, and and I shouldn't say drug addict. She said, you know, it's it's normal to take nine different things that all any addict would die for, you know, and um, so, but, um, you know, everybody's in um, the ICU. My aunt tells this other family, when I walked in, you know what, I think when she was about 10, she was trying to come on to my husband. And I'm like, I was not. I was my favorite uncle ever, my Aunt Kay's son. And, and I'm thinking, are you kidding me? I'm watching all these drugs. I'm listening to this craziness. And I walked into the bathroom and just wept and called Brad, will you pray for me? Because I don't think I'll make it. I don't think I, you know, I'm, I'm, I think Cindy is dying. And um, man, it's just crazy here. And, and I thought, he says, well, why don't you, uh, like, why don't you get somebody to come and anoint her? And I thought, what? Why don't you get someone to come in and pray for her? And I thought, that, you know, yeah. And, and, I, and I thought, that is so, I, I called around. I don't know a lot of churches in the area or pastors, but I called and I said, would you come and anoint my sister because she's in the hospital? And he said, is, is she Christian? Well, <laughs> You know, how do you say, well, she's a stripper. She might be Christian someday, you know, just not, maybe not today. And so I couldn't get anyone that actually would say, we'll do an anointing on someone that has a lifestyle that she has. And I just wanted to weep because I thought, um, God, do you see her? You know, and I kept getting this sense that he sees her. I kept getting this sense that he loves her. I kept getting this sense that he is wooing her to himself, that he doesn't, it, it's like it's not that I'm sorry you're used to that you're using and so I'm not, um, um, I'm not your God. You know, and I, I thought I didn't get that silliness from God and, and so I felt like, well, um, man, I'll just get some anointing oil um, just in case, you know? And I thought, well, how much do I need for my sister? <laughs> I thought, I'll just get a gallon. You know what I mean? <laughs> because you don't want to get just a little thing, you know, because what if you just need to pour it all over her, you know? And so anyhow, I, I, I just got a little bit. But I, I, I called around, couldn't get someone, and then I felt like, and please don't get offended, but I felt like um, um, I just, I'm going to anoint her. And, and, and I don't know if that's legal, and I don't know what anybody thinks, but I love her, and I'm so scared, you know? And um, my mom kind of got the idea that I was going to go in and try to pray for her. And my mom um, hates Christians. 
She, I mean, she, she just, she would rather me be a heroin addict than a Christian. I mean, it's really tough for her, um, the lifestyle that I chose. And I don't, does anybody have a family that would rather you die than actually do this? And so, I mean, it, it really is, there are families like that. And so um, when she found out that I was going to pray, she looked right at me and she said, you know what? Even if I was dying, I'm telling you right now, you cannot and have no right to pray for me. And I thought, okay, I get that. I said, um, um, why? Well, for one, I don't believe in it. And I said, then it shouldn't hurt anything. You know, maybe it is just for me, and maybe whatever. But they ended up approaching the nursing staff, and they, they said to the nursing staff that as a family, they are not giving permission for me to see my sister on my own, that I have to be in there with someone. And I thought, can you do that? And they can. But the nursing staff is looking at my crazy old family, and so we actually, we do, we, we, um, she just has to be with one of us. <laughs> you know? And they're looking at me. <laughs> and they're looking at my family and going like, why? And they said, because I think she's going to pray. And the nurse said, I, that's okay. It's actually okay with us that she does that. Not okay with us. So they actually made it to where I couldn't go in. And I went in the bathroom again and cried like crazy. I called Brad and I said, Brad... I, I, I'm so, I'm scared and I'm lost and, you know, and will you pray for Cindy, will you pray for me? And, and I hear a knock on the, on, the, on the door and I thought, yes, I thought with my sister, I thought we we're going to go through this whole drama again. But it was one of the nurses and she said, why don't you just take the night shift? And I thought, what do you mean? Your family goes home about 10, 30, 11, you take the night shift, um, that would be fine with us. And I thought, oh, stop, how incredible is that? So I took the night shift, and we did an anointing. And the Holy Spirit was so there. God was so present in the room that the nurse had me praying for her husband. We went and prayed for another patient. I mean, it was just the most a beautiful thing, incredible thing. I got called to a church that was a few hours away to do a quick thing with some youth at camp meeting. And, I, and so I went and did that. I come back, and my sister's bed is empty. And I thought, um, man, because to me, my fear was when I took the youth thing that she would die while I was gone. And I was just walked in, and I said to the nurse that I got to know, I said, you know, where is Cindy? And they said that they can only leave those tubes um, in your throat, breathing for you, for about 14 or 15 days. Because what it does is it really trashes your, your vocal cords and your esophagus and all that kind of stuff. And so what they do is they take the tubes out and they put a trach in. And those tubes are, are, are actually more permanent. They kind of bypass a certain thing. And they were taking the tubes out to put the trach in. And my sister starts breathing. So crazy. So they start doing all kinds of stuff. And in the time that I've left, they needed the bed in ICU, and so they gave her a regular bed. She's got oxygen on, which she will wear for the rest of her life. Has anybody seen that little oxygen thing? Rest of her life. Remember she wasn't feeling pretty enough? Have you seen a stripper with an oxygen tank? So anyhow, so now... <laughs> I'm just giving you some images. You know what I mean? It's just ridiculous. So now... I walk in, and she's got this oxygen on, and I know that she is going to not survive very well with all this stuff. And, um, but she's alive, and she's breathing, and she's got her eyes open. Remember they had her in an induced coma? They started bringing her back out. She's, you know, and she's got a long way to go in her recovery, but, man, she's got her eyes open. And, and I walk in, and my family says, don't think this is because you prayed. All right. And so um, within a few days, she gets home. Um, I go home with her. We start to actually do some stuff. Just, just um, if you're going to do recovery, start eating better. Drink some water. Do that kind of stuff. And so I'm like a little health message. You know, I'm trying to teach her how to eat. And she's like, let's just have some coffee. No, 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 your lungs and all that kind of stuff. And she's like, whatever. And so, I, I, you know, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to do all that kind of stuff. It was so funny and ridiculous. And even in the, in the meantime, when, um, when she's got now an oxygen tank at her house, she's got a 56-foot tube that she will have to follow her the rest of her life. When she goes outside, she 
can have a tank that she pulls behind her with the oxygen on her nose. Has anybody seen that? If you have a lot of money, you can get a really cute backpack um, with oxygen. But if you don't, it's a big old tank. And so my sister doesn't have insurance, so it's a big old tank. And, and so we're talking about that, and we're praying, and, and, um, and, and we're trying to eat right. And I stayed for about a, another week, and then I have to go home. And, and it was amazing that she let me pray. And, and, and at one point, she had a friend call, and this is a strip club owner um, that has a dog, and the dog was sick, right? And if you, sometimes when you are in that lifestyle and you're a druggie and you're, you're, you, you're in that industry, when you get older, the only one that likes you is your dog. <laughs> you know what I mean? Your family's gone. Your wife is gone. You've burned everybody out. But his dog is sick, and nobody realizes that if this dog dies, it's a big deal for him. And Cindy says, I'm afraid for him. And so I said, why don't you pray for him? And she says, what? I pray for him. No, 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 you pray for him. And I said, it's not my friend. I don't even know that dog. You know what I mean? And I said, you need to pray for him. And she says, what do I say? And I'm walking out of the room. I said, just ask God to help the dog. You know? And I walked out of the room, and I hear her first prayer ever. She's in the kitchen, and she says, God, can you help the dog? <laughs> you know? And a few hours later, we get a call, the dog is well. Which, you know, God does not always answer prayers, but he answered that prayer. And, and Cindy's just almost shaking, like, do you think? Yes, I think, you know? And, and it was really cool. So I get home, we're still praying. She finds out from the doctor that she has to use oxygen less. They're turning it down. Then she didn't have to use it at night. And we're praying like crazy. I have my friends praying. I mean, we're all praying. And then pretty soon she calls me, and she's really stressed about something. And I said, what is it? And, I mean, she's really stressed. And she said, are you still praying? And I said, yeah. And she said, will you not pray so much because I'm trying to get disability? <laughs> And I thought, oh, stop, are you kidding me? And so that's how crazy addicts are. God will chase us down. God will change things that we don't even know. And we're trying to get disability, $700 a month or whatever that check is. And we're willing to surrender our lungs and our life to our addictions. And I thought, hon, I love you. And I remember just really getting hit with the fact that we're so, it's such a ridiculous thing. Um, to run from God and chase the very thing that's destroying us. And so I, I want to tell you one more story, just how incredible God is. So I get home. I'm back at work. She's getting better and better. Um, she actually cleaned up for about um, almost a year, which was amazing to me. Um, in the meantime, I get a call from my family that my stepdad, the one that thought the aliens were abducting him, um, he's in the hospital now and more than likely will not survive. Um, he's um, six one. I don't know what that is. And, and he's six foot one. He's less than 100 pounds. I mean, he is just skin and bones, and he really is sick. So I've, I, again, raise money. I fly in. I go to the hospital, and I just crawl in the hospital bed with him. Everybody's partying around him. My sister, the, the pee addict, everybody is just having a good time. I'm glad you can make it. And I'm thinking, I'm looking at him, and I know you don't have very long to live at all. And I just want to hold him. I want to say, do you realize you are the only father I know? My dad died in a crack house molesting kids. This is a man that raised me, my mom's boyfriend. And he's been using my whole life, smoking weed and drinking. And I mean, he's just been, uh, he's a bartender. He's a jazz singer. I mean, that's just been his life. But I just want to say, I just, I want you to know that you are the only father I know. And man, I'm going to miss you. And, uh, but he's so high um, on the morphine that they're giving him. He's just having a great time. So they, they say, the nurses come in and say, you know what, we're going to discharge you to hospice. And I thought, don't even say that. So they're going to send him home to die, right? And I looked at everybody in the room, and nobody gets it. And my dad says what every addict thinks. Um, well, what about my morphine? <laughs> 
and the nurse says you can have as much as you want. Because when you're dying, they don't try to regulate that stuff. Whatever you want, you can have. And my dad's eyes were dancing, like, Yahoo! Are you kidding me? You know, he just looked like he just came alive. Like, you mean I can have as much as I want? Like, I could have some more right now? Yeah. What do you want? Do you, you know? He said, can I have an injection? Yeah. Under the tongue, patches, whatever you want. They don't even care if you overdose yourself on the last few days that you live. You know that? As much as you want. For most addicts, all they hear is that. They discharged my dad from home. I flew home to make sure that I had things settled and I could stay with my family um, uh, throughout the rest of his life. And so I get home and Brad is there. I'm in no mood. My sister almost just died. My dad's dying and Brad's like, can I just pray for you? You know what, right now, I love you, but I, I, um, I am so sad. Um, I haven't been around them. I am so going to miss them. Can you just l give me some time? And he's like, can I pray for you? Can I? And even when, like, for him coming up and he wants to touch me, I just want to say right now, I just need you to back off. Do you know what I mean? And I didn't want to be mean, but I just felt like that. I, I want to scream. I want to scream to somebody and say, you know what? My family, most of them have died in their addictions, and I miss them, you know? And, and, and Brad's wanting to pray, and, and so he says, can I come back to your families with you? No. You're going to pray for someone, and they're going to get angry. They, didn't, they barred me from the hospital when I tried to pray for my sister. I said, you just can't come. This is not one of those things, and, and he got kind of teary, like, I just feel like I want to come. I want to pray for your dad, and, and, and he, he did a study, and it was about um, Jonathan and David, which was two best friends, and, and, and Jonathan was a king, and, and uh, or David was a king, and Jonathan was his best friend, and, and with Jonathan said to David, if I die, will you take care of my family? He said, yeah, and he said, if I die, take care of my family, and they just made this agreement, where Jonathan does die, so David said, does he have any family? And he did have a, a, a son named Mel. <laughs> and, and I mean, it's just a hard name to present, uh, uh, pronounce, so I'll just say Mel. So he had a son. But it, the son was um, deformed. And in those days, they felt like that was a curse from God or something. And when, God, when Brad was reading the story, he just felt like it, what he heard is, but the son is an addict. And David said, invite him to live with me anyway. And he said, I just want to tell your dad that I believe that God is saying, come anyway. I know that you felt like you've wasted your whole life, and I know that you feel lost, but I am telling you, there is a place right here at the table for you. And so Brad said, I have to tell him that. And, and, and I couldn't argue with that. So now we buy a flight. We, we end up back at my sister's or my mom's house. And the house is an addict's house. It's dark. It's filthy. Everybody's high. My dad had a couple other kids that were alcoholic that are coming to say goodbye to him. And they're, they're, I really don't know them well, but they're my dad's sons. And, and we're all trying to do whatever. My sister, the stripper, is there. She's got her boyfriend who's a drug dealer there. My dad's laying there asking for more morphine, having a great time. And, and I'm just wanting to, I, I just wanted to sob because in recovery, has anybody been in recovery and you look at all that craziness and you just think, I, I remember being there, um, but man, I just want to jump in and say, please, you know? And so I, you know, we're, we're doing all that. And my younger sister, the meth addict or the pee addict says, you know what? I think I'm going to make some tacos, you know, because uh, you know how much dad likes tacos. And it was almost Christmas. And so instead of, you know, for us, we do drugs and eat tacos. That was our, that kind of our celebration. So he's like, I'm going to make some tacos. And she gets up and she's like, goes in the kitchen and you can hear all this stuff. And, and all of a sudden, there was a rotten smell that just went through the entire house. Brad and I are in the living room going like, what is that? And we realize it's whatever Joni is cooking in the kitchen, but it's so rotten that you almost are gagging. And Brad is a cook, so I said, Brad, go in the kitchen and see if you can help her. And he's like, oh, man. So he goes in, and he says, um, he's so, he's so, he's just gorgeous, but he goes in, and he says, do you need some help? How is that meat, by the way? And she says, oh, it's good. Yes, yeah, it's, it's right. And he's like, yeah, she said, I think it needs some spices. <laughs> 
<laughs> and has anybody cooked rotten meat? Well, you, sometimes you can cook the rot right out of it, but sometimes you can't. Depends on how bad it is. So, so he's thinking, well, we'll just try to see if we can kind of resurrect some of this. And it was so bad. She, she kind of gets bored and she leaves. And he's in the kitchen and he, he finally realizes this is bad. And he looks at the package and it's about a month old and it's been in the refrigerator, not the freezer, right? So it's bad, 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 bad. And so he calls my mom in and he says to my mom, um, I don't want to embarrass Joni, but I think this meat is bad, right? And my mom fell in love with him. I saw it. I watched it. And my mom doesn't really um, connect with a lot of people. She was damaged her whole life. And so I, th I thought, what just happened? Does anybody get what just happened? What just happened, do you think? Somebody showed respect to my mom's youngest child, who is an addict. Nobody, I mean, people talk in front of her. People don't respect her. They say all kinds of stuff, but that is my mom's child. And she listened to Brad not wanting to embarrass her, and she just wanted to say thank you. You know, thanks. And so at that moment, I said, Brad, go to the store, get whatever you can for tacos, and, and we'll, just, we'll just, you know, do it from um, scratch. We'll just get some um, avocado and some cilantro and some guacamole. We'll make guacamole and we'll make tacos and have everything fresh. And so he goes to the store. In the meantime, I go into where my dad's at, and I say, Dad, do you remember the first song you ever taught me? And he's like, no. And I was little, I was probably four when he moved in. And I said, and raise your hand if you know this song. Trailers for sale or rent, rooms to let 50 cents. And it's about somebody looking, ain't got no cigarettes, a butt. And it was uh, my dad teaching me about this bomb looking for a cigarette butt, <laughs> you know? Old stogies I have found, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, and, and we started to just say, sing the song. And my dad's son um, um, sang, and my dad tried to sing. And, and they had just put a stent in my dad's throat because he had cancer that kind of collapsed his esophagus. So it was really difficult for him, but he tried to sing. And, and, and earlier in the day, so you've got to follow me on this story. It's almost done. But earlier in the day, my dad said, I want to be buried in a Lakers journey, jersey or an all blacks jersey. He just sees a sports night, he likes the Lakers. And my mom said, buried? Are you kidding me? We don't even believe in that stuff. You're gonna, you're gonna be in a closet, in a jar, you know what I mean? And so <laughs> my sister, the pee addict, says he could be buried if he wants to. And, and what's wrong with that? So they have this huge argument. So I said to my brother's son, go get him a Lakers jersey. So as we're singing, my brother's son comes in with a Lakers jersey. And my dad just smiles. And he says, how, how cool is that? And so, so he puts it on the bed. I said, no, 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 put it on. And he puts it on. And it's like he came alive. It was so weird. He puts it on, and he stands up. Well, he wasn't even able to hardly stand up. They put him in a wheelchair to bring him in. He has a walker that he's using. I mean, he's skinny as. He's just so, so near death. And he stands up, and he says to me, how do I look? And I thought, well, like a cancer patient with a Lakers jersey on. <laughs> you know, I don't want to lie to you, you know. <laughs> but, you know, I didn't say that. But, I mean, it's like, yeah, good. And, and he says, I'd like to go out and, and, and show everybody. So he grabs a walker, and he slowly makes his way out. By the time we turn the corner... I look in the kitchen, and it looks like a Martha Stewart show. Brad has my sister, the stripper, in there cutting up avocados. He's got everybody in there doing a job. He's opened the windows. There's fresh air, and he is kind of praying for everybody. And I'm thinking, what just happened? My family has never looked this healthy ever. I mean, it was just ridiculous. And I'm thinking, what did you just do, hon? And I, I couldn't even, I'm watching my dad walk around the corner. My sister brings him some guacamole. He's eaten a little bit. He hasn't eaten for a long time because his cancer was just dissolved, his esophagus and stuff. And he eats a little bit. And he sits in that chair. Remember I told you the chair with all his paraphernalia? And he says goodbye to each one of us for the next two hours. Doesn't do a drug. We laugh about things we remember, about times that we got through. Because the worst addict still has people that love them. 
You know, we don't want you to die in your addictions. We miss you, all that kind of stuff. But man, I, I loved him um, and still love him. And so we just did all that kind of stuff. I felt like the presence of God in my house. And I'm thinking, man, I just have never felt that. I never thought that this day would happen. And so we're just saying goodbye. And he gets tired and he decides, you know, I'm going back to my room. I know that Brad flew in to pray for my dad, to tell him about his own journey and to tell him about what he felt like God wanted to share with him. So Brad starts to help my dad into the room. I know exactly what's going to happen. I have a bottle of anointing oil that I have in my hand because I always have anointing oil with me. And so I have the anointing oil in my hand and my mom says, what's that in your hand? And I thought, oh, man. <laughs> uh, I know she just hates that stuff. So I said, oh, it's frankincense and myrrh. <laughs> and so she says, what, did you run into some wise guys? <laughs> and I thought, I couldn't even stand it. What does my mom know about wise men and frankincense and myrrh? What does she know about that? And did I assume that she knows nothing about God, and do I need to repent of that? That moment, I realized that I know nothing about what she knows. I don't know her injuries. I don't know where she shut off. I don't know what she's mad about or where she got lost, but I just thought, man, I have no idea. So Brad goes in there and talks with my dad. At one point, he says, there is a chair at the table um, waiting for you. Man, can we pray? What do you think? And my dad gives his life to God. <laughs> How crazy is that? On his almost last breath, and God is in the house. God is wooing my family. God is loving my family. And all of a sudden I realize, you know what? Unless we are not breathing, we have a God that says, how can I let you go? I know that you are destroying yourself in your addictions. I know that you're going to say goodbye to your very organs, but I will not stop. I will not stop. I give you this day to choose life or death. Choose life, and I will follow you your whole life. But even with my dad, my dad um, gives his life to God. Him and Brad have the most incredible time. Brad finally, my dad says, you know, he's tired and he wanted to shut his eyes and, um, and um, Brad walks out and my sister's there, the meth addict, the pee addict. What were you just doing? What were you doing in there with my dad? You know, and Joni's mad. You know, she, I mean, she really does not want you to pray. She's got a lot of influence on my mom. She's really mad. And, and all Brad says is, man, your dad's afraid. He is dying. And we just talked about that as men. And I said a prayer for him. And Joni finally just looked at Brad and she said, okay, okay. And Brad said, can I say a prayer for you? She just went, she just like, what are you talking about saying a prayer for me? I don't even know, you know. And she said, she's in the, she's in the hallway, and she said, Cherie, I thought he was just, I said, okay. Finally, I said, okay. And I thought he was just going to go somewhere and say a prayer. But he just held her hands, and he said a prayer. He said she, her whole body shook and trembled. And he just said simply, God, hang out with her. Tell her a joke. Laugh with her. Because I don't know what she thinks about God. But she is in trouble. Um, let her love you. Love her. And we're done. Um, my dad passes and we go home. It was the hardest thing to watch all that kind of stuff. But to, for a moment, in my family, I knew that God was present and people were feeling and receiving that. So I get home and um, they had the eulogy in the living room. My dad is in the closet in an urn, um, I think underneath my mom's laundry. But anyhow, so um, um, they were having a eulogy in the living room and my sister told the taco story at the eulogy. She called me and she said, is Brad a priest or something? <laughs> 
I'm thinking, he is so new at this Christianity thing. I, watch, I heard him ministering to somebody one time, and he's like telling the person, you know, it really is about faith. Do you have faith in God? Like there was this guy, he said, um, and it's in the Bible, um, that saw Jesus like walking on water. And he said, can I come out there with you? And the, the guy's name, I think, was Moses. And... and <laughs> And I didn't want to interfere with him and say, you know, hon, it wasn't Moses. <laughs> but, you know, and for people that don't know, it was a guy named Peter. But anyhow, so he thought it was Moses. And, 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 and so he never, he doesn't even get the names right. He gets the stories right, kind of, but he's very new. And I wanted to tell my family, not only is he not a priest, but he's very new. Because what's really interesting about God is I don't care if you call on him today or you have called on him or been with him for the last 30 years. Same God, same power same love and, and and none of us have more of it than someone else and so Brad is very new but you know what he was crazy enough to believe that the God of heaven loves my family I had lost hope of all that and he walked in my family and and literally uh, change them. It was so absolutely amazing so my younger sister and I'll end with this my younger sister calls excuse me texts and she says, um, hey, hey, um, I went into a thrift store today. Yeah, cool. What'd you get? A pair of shoes? Good. What's up? Well, you know there was a sticker on the shoes. <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, what'd the sticker say? It said, God loves you. What do you think that means? <laughs> God loves you? That's what I thought she said. <laughs> so even at this point, what I want to say in recovery and what I've seen in my own life and my family's life, it's literally, it's not that I'm going to listen to what people think about God. I promise you there's a God in heaven that knows your name, that can walk through, with your, walk through in your recovery. And I don't care if it's sex. I don't care if it's drugs, I don't care if it's religious addiction, cutting, eating disorders, spending, whatever. You approach God and say, you know what, I don't know what the next step is. Let him be your recovery partner. Grab a hold of someone else, connect with someone else. They're having a recovery group here that um, will follow when I leave. Grab hold of that, but there's a God in heaven that doesn't need anything else. When your filling falls out, he says, you know what? Let's get to the dentist. You know what I mean? He really, really is aware of all that. Um, and I just promise you that you have to put your hand up and say, I'm done. I am powerless with this. Don't leave me like this. And I'll step into the next thing. And when he says, you know what the next thing for you is? Grab hold of a partner physical partner, jump into a group, have a glass of water rather than a bottle of tequila. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like he'll literally start instructing you on some things and try to follow those instructions because they'll save your life. He's really surrounded me about, uh, 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 around a lot of people. I thought I had no gifts. I found out I like to write, right? I like to write. I've written five books. One is in seven languages. How st crazy is that, coming from heroin addiction and being strung out? And I don't want to say that in a bragging sense on myself, but I want to brag on God. The only gift I have is I don't shut up. So I have a radio show and a television show. <laughs> How fun is that? I make my living with talking. I mean, and, and ask Marianne, I never shut up. I mean, she drives her crazy, you know, because she's kind of not like that. But it's just, you know, so God will find out what your giftings are, who you are, and literally wake some of that kind of stuff. And I like the arts, and I like drawing, and, um, you know, I do a lot of the arts. Um, I work with at-risk kids, and I couldn't figure out how to reach them. The first time I went into a trailer park with a bunch of pee addicts with some little kids, I said to this one little tiny kid, five, six years old, hi, how are you? And he cussed me out. I thought, did you just say that? I mean, he used languages that I wouldn't even use in front of you. I mean, I mean, it was just so intense. And, and, and I, I looked at myself and I thought, oh man, I probably look like a social worker. It looks like I'm going to remove him from the home. It looks like somebody that is not safe or maybe even Mary Poppins. I don't know what I look like, um, but he didn't trust me. And I prayed, how am I going to reach him? Because they're not just letting us talk. 
And within a few months, God gave me nine horses. I've never saddled a horse. Um, now I have a ranch, nine horses. And when I walk in that very place, you know what I say? Anybody want to learn to ride a horse? <laughs> They all come, the family says yes, they sign papers, we bring them over, and it may be the first thing that they've done that is just normal and healthy in their lives, right? But I just think that you have a God in heaven that you need to start praying. Do you see me? Can you do this tomorrow? And we have to surrender a lot. Remember the first thing I had to surrender is my very thought of suicide. I wanted to die every day of my life. I've jumped off houses. I've cut myself. I've taken overdoses. And the first thing God said is, I want you to choose life. That was hard for me. And all the other things that came with that um, were important. And so God is going to ask you to do things that are pretty intense. Um, but he'll be with you every part of that. I want to say, um, man, I could go on and on. Any, anybody want to say anything or have any questions before we end tonight? Yes. Mm-hmm. Right. And how important for someone to confess to you and help you in that process. I confess to me. So I don't think that in the, what the Bible says is confess your sins one to another. Pray for each other so you could be healed. And so any kind of, uh, as we are walking alongside each other in recovery, we do have the right to pray for each other and to say out loud to each other the different things that have happened in our lives. And that's kind of like confession. But it's not like a priest um, and a, a and so a, a injured person. It's just like two partners. We, I'm your sister. Um, on this spiritual journey. And so if you and I are talking, and you're talking about some of the pain that you've gone through, man, um, say it out loud and let's pray. Because healing comes from that. But it's not the same as a confession, like in a confessional and all that kind of stuff. But even with my family, the things, I had to forgive my family because I was so angry that I am watching people die because nobody was brave enough to step into recovery. That was really tough to forgive them. I forgive you for, I've never really been close to my siblings because we got lost in addictions so early. And I had to forgive uh, my grandparents for being alcoholics and my mom and, and dad for their addictions and myself for whatever. But, you know, that forgiveness process is really important. And when I get to do that with, like if you were and I were friends and I said, you know, I'm working on this right now, can I talk about it and would you pray for me? Um, it really is a gift that she gives me, just allowing me to say it out loud, um, praying for me or with me, and the healing comes because of that connection. So there, it's really, it's, it, it, it really is a huge part of our healing. Yeah. There, there's sometimes that you will actually go to someone. And whether you hurt them or they hurt you, and, and, and you can go to them and say, you know what, I really, I, I, you know, I, I want to ask your forgiveness or I choose to forgive you. Like I went to my mom and asked her to forgive me because I didn't realize that every time I tried to get her to love me, she felt guilt and shame. And when God showed me that, I said, I'm so sorry because I didn't know. And so I said, would you choose to forgive me um, for, for demanding that you love me? And, um, and she just said, like, what? Um, but it was an important thing for me to do. So sometimes you do that. But sometimes, man, don't do that because you're going to cause more injury. Like if you were my best friend and I slept with your husband 10 years ago, and I said, you know what, I just want to say sorry that I slept with him. Uh, and your husband saying, really, you're going to bring that up 10 years later and, and you've destroyed my marriage and all that kind of stuff. So there are some times that you don't do that. You take it to God, you take it to your group, you take it to counseling if you need to. But if you're going to injure someone um, by the very act of trying to, to work on your own anger or resentment or your own unforgiveness, uh, man, hold up. Don't do it. Um, if it's gonna if it's gonna benefit them and you, 
um, do it. You know, and, and you'll know if you're confused about that, ask a friend, um, ask a counselor, hang out with your pastor or whatever, and ask somebody, what do you think? Um, I went to my dad, who was my primary abuser, not my only one, but I, 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 we talked about it. I forgave him, but I walked out of the relationship. He's never seen my child. He's never held her um, because he never did recover. He would have um, injured her or, or brought all that into our uh, life, so it's not not a reconciliation, but I did go to him. Some people you will, some people you won't. That was a great question. Thank you for that. Yes. You're one of 19. Wow. <laughs> Can I just say wow first? That's a huge family. Mm-hmm. So Christian family, very united, um, very church-minded. Till mom died. Wow, till your mom died. Dad had gone. Dad was a, a uh, orphan at the age of six in the world. Wow. Amen. Today, my family has fallen apart. The rock fell out of wow. the So let me just, for people that can't hear, um, everything was um, incredibly united, a loving family, m until mom died. Um, Dad became alcoholic. He had very little love and parenting growing up, didn't know how to do that, and the family fell apart. Yeah. I'm really sorry. Now my eldest sister going into her 80s. There may be only four, maybe five of us that don't frequent the alcohol. Wow. Well. The rest of the family are alcohol and drug and abuse. For me, I've always been with the church and I've, they've always had me to lead. Amen. So let me just, um, it sounds like the whole family fell apart. And just like when you do recovery, you actually pull people into recovery. It's an incredible thing. Like my sister's children are not addicts. And so, so you can go pull a whole family in that direction. But when you get lost in your addiction, you can actually pull a family in that direction. And, she, and, and what she was saying is that most of her family, other than four, out of all of those 19 and their children, all got lost in very um, things, alcohol being the primary one. And out of all of them, you are kind of um, the spiritual person in your family. Wow. Wow. I love who I am. I love what I do. I feel lost with my family as they are lost in their, yeah. in their addiction. And so being, being um, you know, it's a really, even, I, I totally get that when you look at your family and you feel lost. You feel like you want to do something, you want to say something, you want to make a difference. And it is the, it is the saddest thing to, to know that, um, in recovery, they actually could have a different life. Um, they don't have to die of liver disease and and uh, and um, wet brain or alcoholic stuff, and you know it's re uh, diabetes and all heart disease and all the stuff that comes with that. And so what you're saying, it breaks your heart to to look at that, knowing that they don't have they didn't have to go there. They, they, they have watched me. I am diabetic. They have watched me overcome that. Amen. Yeah. Help me to help them if it's possible 
Amen. So, so it, it doesn't does it matter when when you are surrounded by that. To me, in my own recovery, my sister, my older sister's daughter, gets married, right? And so she says, um, she calls me up, and I don't I don't see them a lot because um, we just, uh, we, you know, we just never bonded as kids because of all the drugs and alcohol and all the stuff and the difference in our lifestyle and all that. But she calls and she says, we don't know any normal people. <laughs> Would you marry me? And I thought, what do you mean? I don't think it's legal. I'm like, I'm not a pastor, not whatever. And they said, in, in our state, you can have a license for the day to marry someone. And so we got you that license. Would you marry us? And I thought, oh, man. Um, and I, and I, and I, so I, you know, I, I fly in. I talk to my pastor. I fly in, and I get some hints on you know, marrying someone. And, and I love them. And by the, the, the afternoon, everybody's drunk. Everybody's high. Um, I go to bed early because sometimes when everybody starts drinking, it's like 7, 8, 9 o'clock at night. They can get pretty crazy. So I just go to bed. I'll see you in the morning. And in the next morning, they have um, um, Bloody Marys for breakfast because everybody's hung over so vodka and, and tomato juice and all that kind of stuff and and um for my niece I did marry her and um I I got her a family bible you know and um and everybody's opening up the gifts that they gave to the bride and groom and it came to mind and I thought that I I everybody's my mom especially is not going to like this gift it has her name on it and her husband's name their surname, their family name. And, and um, she opened the Bible and she just started weeping. And she said, thank you so much, you know? And then my other niece, who is partying like crazy, said, when I get married, are you gonna get me one? So it was like, I think it matters. And as much pain as we walk with when we see people we love not um, getting lost in their addiction, man, um, nobody else may be praying for them on the planet. But you don't forget them. You know, I'm standing here because an auntie prayed for me my whole life. I got to see her before she died, and I got to say thank you. And I was scared because I thought, you know, I know that you prayed for me even when I was lost and on the streets. And, and she said, I prayed for your mom because she raised my mom, and I prayed for your mom. And, and I said, who's going to pray now because she's dying? And she said, it looks like you are. So it's almost like it is the most painful thing to love an addict or an alcoholic or somebody that is self-abusive or lost in that, um, but love them anyway because um, we may be the only one praying for them. And, and I know that in your life you have felt the pain of their addiction. Um, hang in there because, you know, one day we're going to be on the other side of all this <laughs> and I get to see him clean. I got to hang out with my stepdad, you know, who I call my dad. And he's going to be walking, I think, on the sea of glass, saying, "Woohoo!" <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But it's a whole different thing, because he's not going to be looking for morphine. He's going to be looking to the people he loves that he was never able to just fully be in relationship with. And on that side, he gets to do that. And so for people that love an addict, man, first of all, I want to say, um, sorry. <laughs> You know, because we're obnoxious and we're, we lie and we cheat and we're out there using and pretty soon our liver's failing and we got hepatitis C and all that kind of junk. Love them anyway. Um, for people that are thinking about recovery, man, do it. Um, this never, addictions are always progressive. They will never let go of you. Um, next year, it's worse. Five years from now, it's worse. You're raising um, kids that will be the next addicts, and you can't do anything about that until you choose to get well, and then everything changes. And so um, I'm, I'm going to encourage you. Tomorrow, we're going to look at passages in addiction. We'll look at, how, you know, what, what does it look like to come out? What kind of things um, do you need to be aware of? Um, but um, uh, tonight... The only thing I want you to know is that there's a God that can restore you to sanity, can intervene in your family in ways that you will never even fully appreciate, um, can literally step in when you get feelings that fall out or when you're, you, you know, when you, um, you're dying because of your own addictions and can step in. And he wants to heal us. There's a place in Isaiah 57, 18, says, I know all your garbage and I want to heal you anyway. And I think, are you kidding me? 
you know everything and you want to heal me, you delight in my recovery. And Hosea, there's a book, um, Hosea, and in this book, he says, how could I let you go? Even when you're destroying yourself, I will not stop pursuing you. I will not let you go. I love you. And so I just have to say there is a God that says, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not going anywhere. Um, until your last breath, I will pursue you and I will offer you life. And all we have to do is uh, grab hold of that. Um, thank you for letting me go on and on. If you think about me or my family, please pray for them. Okay. Thank you, Sheree. You've painted a, a pretty amazing picture of God, and uh, tonight I just want to give you thanks for, uh, for being that vessel to do that. And um, tonight, as always, we've got our ministry teams that will be available if you want to talk with us or pray with us up front here. Um, those of you that just want to mix and mingle, I have some refreshments that will also be available uh, down the hall to the left there, my left, and um, thank you for being with us tonight. Uh, let's pray together, and... Um, then we'll uh, have our special prayer times up front here. Father in heaven, we just give you thanks tonight because you have revealed yourself. You've shown a picture. It may, may be a very different picture for some of us um, when we think of this word God. And uh, Lord, I just pray that you will continue to touch hearts, to touch lives, and reveal yourself. So as we have heard how you have shown yourself to Cherie, I pray that you would personally reveal yourself to every person in this room in one way or another. And as Cherie likes to say, tell us a joke. You know, just reveal yourself in some way that we just, it's undeniable, it's unquestionable, and it just reveals the goodness of who you are and the fact that you are a constant, reliable, faithful companion. And one who is not just merely a companion, but one who has power to redeem, to save, to turn around, to renew. Uh, be that person to us. And, I, and so I just pray, Lord, that you'll bless us in that journey. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.